This is the Cato Daily Podcast for Thursday, April 2nd, 2020. I'm Caleb Brown. The modern homeschooling movement really isn't that old and has roots in both the countercultural left and religious right. As parents find themselves with an opportunity to more directly educate their children, Cato's Carrie McDonald discusses what might be coming next for the homeschooling movement in the United States. We're seeing a lot of parents increasingly curious about what real homeschooling looks like. Uh, Of course, we've said all along, this is not real homeschooling. Uh, This is a situation that all of us are finding very stressful and difficult. But it is um, prompting some parents who may have been intrigued by the idea of homeschooling to uh, look for some more resources. So I'm seeing many conventional uh, school parents joining Facebook groups for homeschoolers uh, and seeing increased interest in what real homeschooling might look like. In fact, I ran into a neighbor recently whose 10-year-old child is in a conventional public school and, you know, at a safe six-foot distance was asking her how things were going at home. Uh, And she said that, her child is just blooming, just devouring books, uh, writing short stories, really taking charge of her education and is so much happier. And so I said, oh, I wonder, you know, would you think about continuing with this uh, after the pandemic ends? And she said, we are strongly considering it. She said, I'm so surprised it's going so well. So I think to the extent that parents can disconnect from curriculum assignments in a lot of states, they're being absolved from uh, curriculum uh, requirements, that they can start to see how their children's natural curiosity and passion for learning can reemerge and they'll be able to learn so much over these coming weeks. Where did we get homeschooling? Of course, that seems like kind of an odd question because there was a time when there weren't schools. Um, But at least in this country, in the last four or five decades, where did that idea come from? So the modern homeschooling movement really originated from the countercultural left in the late 60s and early 1970s, families living on communes and refusing to send their children to school, um, was really where modern homeschooling emerged. Uh, John Holt was one of the early pioneers of the homeschooling, modern homeschooling movement, creating the first newsletter for homeschooling families in 1977 called Growing Without Schooling. And it was there that he coined the term unschooling, which he defined as taking children out of school. And of course, this was a time when compulsory attendance laws in many cases um, prevented parents from homeschooling or the rules were fuzzy, and so it wasn't clear what kind of parental authority existed to allow families to homeschool. Uh, The religious right began to become really interested in this idea of homeschooling as well, and that's where the numbers began to swell in terms of homeschooling throughout the 1980s, really driven uh, by conservatives who wanted to educate their children at home. Homeschooling became legally recognized in all 50 states by 1993, In 1999, it was the first year that the federal government began tracking numbers of homeschoolers, counting 850,000. And now we're at uh, close to 2 million, roughly 1.7 million uh, homeschoolers in this country, although state-level data suggests that the federal data is wildly underreported. Um, states show you know, increasing numbers of homeschooling. So there are some estimates that homeschooling really could be around two and a half million students nationwide. And with the growth in its numbers has come a tremendous growth in terms of the diversity of the homeschooling population. So now we see homeschoolers um, geographically, demographically, and ideologically diverse, that it's no longer just Um, you know, kind of religious homeschoolers driving the process. Much of the growth, for example, right now in the modern homeschooling movement is urban secular parents who are frustrated by standardized testing and a one-size-fits-all mass schooling model. So uh, that is happening. We're seeing um, much more racial diversity. There's about 8% of homeschoolers are African-American 25% uh, Hispanic, which is on par with the K-12 school age population. Uh, So a lot of growth in terms of diversity. And the number one motivator uh, for homeschooling parents, why they're choosing to homeschool, according to federal data, is concern about the environment of other schools, including peer pressure, bullying, substance abuse, and so on. Socioeconomic status would seem to uh, make homeschooling 
either a very distinct possibility or not really a very likely possibility. The ability to have a, a parent at home is is pretty key for uh, homeschooling. Um, so going forward, what might that look like? Let's assume that uh, the, the ranks of homeschoolers swell uh, nationwide uh, because of this pandemic that we're experiencing right now. What might homeschooling look like in five, 10 years? Well, over the past decade, along with its diversity in other areas, homeschooling has become much more socioeconomically diverse, more two working parents choosing homeschooling, more single parents choosing homeschooling. Um, in many ways, homeschooling can become the legal lever to put parents back in charge of their child's education and allow for that freedom and flexibility and experimentation that simply doesn't exist uh, in conventional schools, either public or private, when they're tied to state compulsory schooling statutes. So homeschooling is really an opportunity for a lot of education innovation. And we're already seeing that uh, in terms of hybrid homeschooling programs emerging where young people might attend a building or a learning center a couple of days a week, and then the remain, remainder of that time is spent at home or out in their community taking classes and so on. For example, there's a public charter school in California called the Da Vinci Charter School Network that operates on this hybrid uh, homeschooling model where kids go to a building two days a week and learn from teachers in that building, and then the rest of the time they're at home. So that's an, an instance where it is free to the parent in terms of accessing this other type of learning model. Um, we're also seeing low-cost private microschool networks emerge. Um, the Prenda microschool network, for example, in Arizona, is also a low-cost private school model um, that off also takes advantage of Arizona's robust education choice mechanisms to defray costs for families that want it. And that network is growing exponentially. And I think, you know, we'll see more a demand from, fa from families after this pandemic for more education choice and variety of education options. I think there'll be a higher demand for tax credit scholarship programs and education savings accounts that separate education from schooling and allow families to use some of that public money uh, towards tutors or community classes or books and resources uh, so that it's not just thinking about schooling and tuition the way voucher programs do, but that it's allowing for a much broader expanded definition of education that we're all getting a glimpse of as we're all learning without conventional schooling right now. Carrie McDonald is author of the book Unschooled. She's also a Cato Institute adjunct scholar. Subscribe to the Cato Daily Podcast wherever you please and follow us on Twitter at Cato Podcast. 